This free will stuff leads to people boasting before God, denying the scripture, twisting the scripture, and then trying to bring accusation on the children of God and on to the saints who hold to the sovereignty of God as the scripture teaches it and God's predetermination. See, when it comes down to it, there's a large aspect of God that these people do not like. In fact, they hate it. They hate God. They hate a God that chooses people. And they hate those people who say that they're chosen. Those who say that God chooses people, they hate those people too. And yet Jesus was one of those people. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So these people clearly hate a God that chooses, and they clearly hate those people who say that God has chosen them out of the world, and that's exactly what Jesus said. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your night or day is going good. Everything's going well with you. I wanted to analyze the statement that has been made over and over by the free will grace community that God is outside of time. And I'll play a short clip that will be an example of that. Greg Jackson has made the same statement. People that hold to free will have made this statement over and over that God is outside of time. And what they're trying to give you a picture of is and when it comes to salvation of people and when it comes to things that happen in reality God is outside of time and he's watching things happen some of them will say by his foreknowledge before he creates anything in the world he knows what's going to happen by his foreknowledge and he's outside of time and he's watching how things will play out in a free will system if you could imagine some stranger outside of your house peering in your window and they're outside of your house and they're looking in and they're watching things happen. They're not directly involved in what's happening inside the house. They're just merely a, a gazer. They may say that he'll intervene in time at certain points, at certain places, but he amazingly is just watching this free will system play out through time. So that when it comes to salvation, God is not directly involved in saving people, nor is he directly involved in the events that happen, whether good or bad in reality. So I'll play this very short clip, and this is the statement that I'm referring to, and we'll analyze it in accordance to scripture. Hey guys, uh, my husband and I were talking this morning about how God exists the confines of time and space like as we know it you know um so that's the clip and partially the reason why i'm showing her saying this is because she's done another recent post where she says that the doctrines of predeterminism are from the pits of hell in other words if you teach that god predetermines things that's a satanic doctrine now she never demonstrates it from the scripture it's only emotion it's only things that she doesn't like that just upset her, by which then she labels accusation against the person. I'll show you that post. I'm not going to read the whole thing. If you're interested in reading the whole thing, you can always go to her channel. But here at the end, it says predeterminist and all the points of Calvinist tulip. Just she brings in people that hold to predetermination into what she says here. And she says, are demonic doctrines from the pits of hell? If you are teaching that crap, you better off to tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the ocean for all the stumbling you may cause. You seriously need to repent. So they believe, again, that I can get in the way of God, that people can actually frustrate the plans of God rather than the other way around, which is what the scripture teaches, that he nullifies the councils of nations and he frustrates the plans of the people and the desire of his heart stand from generation to generation. That includes the saving of men's souls. 
But we will get into those verses and verses that God predetermines things so that you will see that this doctrine is not from the pen of hell. This is from the scripture, that this is God's reality that he created and he has the right to have control over it. And this right here is merely an example of a person who's provided no scripture to back up their points. They only are emotional. They only have an emotional response, giving the accusation that if you teach the sovereignty of God, that he predetermines things, including the predetermination of men's salvation, then it would be better for me not to have been born. It would be better, better for me to have a millstone around my neck and me to be cast into the ocean. Now, if you don't accept God's predetermination and that all things work according to the counsel of his will, as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 tells us. Also, having obtained an inheritance, having been predestined by him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So they want to give the impression that God is outside of time just watching this free will system happen. But the Bible says that he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. All means all, everything. He's working all things according to the counsel of his will. And it shows us including the predestinating of men's souls and where they will be. He predestined us to adoption. See, having obtained an inheritance, being predestined by him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So God works all things according to the counsel of his will, including the predestinating of men and where they will be and where they will spend an eternity. And we see from scripture, he decides this before the foundation of the world, that he chooses people for salvation before the foundation of the world, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. So he predestined us to adoption, that is he predecided our destination and he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before men could think, before they were alive, before they had a will, before they could make choices. God made a choice before the foundation of the world, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And in love he predestined, that is he decided our destination prior to us even being alive before the foundation of the world, he predestined us to adoption according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. So we see when it comes to salvation, God predetermines, he predestinates. He predecides and he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. As God is choosing people from the very beginning, before the foundation of the world, he's choosing people to be saved. As you see the Apostle Paul say, brothers and sisters, beloved of God, we're always bound to give thanks to God for you. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So Paul is recognizing that God predetermines people's salvation, that from the beginning, God chose you to be saved. Remember, this is the God who declares the end from the beginning. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that have not been done saying my purposes will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, which by the way is predetermination because the Lord is saying, I declare the end from the beginning, that from the very beginning, I declare how things will end and I will accomplish all my purposes and I will do all my good pleasure. So God teaches predetermination that all things are working according to the counsel of his will. He's declaring the end from the beginning that before things will end, he's already declared its outcome from the very beginning. I declare the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that have not been done saying my purposes will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. And that includes the salvation of men's souls as we see Brothers and sisters, beloved of God, we're always bound to give thanks to God for you. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. That God chose you to be saved. He chose you to be saved so that you would believe in the truth. So you see, she has this predeterminism, and if you hold to it, you're teaching a doctrine of demons. She doesn't supply any biblical support, just an emotional stance. She says that if we're teaching that, God is working all things according to the counsel of his will, because 
that's what God is doing. And he's not just making it up as he goes along. He's decided it the end from the very beginning. He had a purpose and a plan from the very beginning, and he's going to accomplish that completely. So they want to give you this impression that God is just outside of time watching a free will system play out as though God hasn't predetermined things and as though he doesn't have a purpose and a reason and, a, and meaning for everything that happens. In many cases, they make God a victim of his own reality that he created because he wants every single person to be saved, but he's unable to bring that about ultimately. He wants every single person saved, but the reality that unfolds before him most times does not give him the result that he ultimately desires. So you can see the threats and accusation in this post that we'd better not to be born, to have a millstone around neck and be thrown in the ocean. And this happens to a lot of people when you bring them grace. I've noticed this through the years. When I brought them grace, they will turn around with threats and accusation threaten you with hell and judgment. And this is always a demonstration to me of someone who doesn't understand the grace of God, how wicked and undeserving of salvation that people are. And when you think that, that it's a collective unilateral thing that everybody is obligated to have, and if God doesn't give it to them, he's unjust and he's unfair, he's unrighteous, then you don't know what grace is. And you don't know how wicked, sinful people are according to scripture, that there's none righteous and that there's none who seek after God and that there's none who understand. As it says in the scripture, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understand. There is none who seek after God. They have all gone out of their way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. So these people will tell you that they are the exception to the rule, that they have sought after God when the Bible says there's none who seek after God. Because of our unrighteousness, because there's none who do good, there's none who seek after God. We have an inability to do what is right and righteous and approach a holy God. And the scripture says there's none who seek after God. So when it comes to salvation, we see that God is not outside of time watching people be saved he's saving them As jesus says john 6 44 no man can come to me unless the father sent me draws him and i will raise him up at the last day jesus is saying no man can come to me no man has the ability jesus is making a universal claim that no man has the ability to come to me in their sinfulness in their unrighteousness they have gone astray they have gone their own way there's none who does good and so by an act of sovereign grace, God draws a person to the Son. And then he raises that person up to eternal life. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So no man can come unless God, by an act of his grace, draws that sinful person who does not seek after him to himself. And then he raises that person up by an act of grace to eternal life on the last day. So what really all be still to know is saying here is that if it's not do as thou wilt system, then you're teaching something demonic if you're not teaching do as thy will. And as has been pointed out before from my brother Lewis that these people who keep having this free will system do as thy wilt is more in lines with Satanism and what Satanism teaches. The Bible teaches that God does as he wills. I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and I bless the Most High who lives forever and ever, for his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and it endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will among the host of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can hold back his hand and say, What have you done? So we see the scripture tell us that when it comes to God's will from generation to generation, the people are accounted as nothing. In other words, their will, their desires, their plans, what they would want is accounted as nothing as God does according to his will from generation to generation. And then it says, and no one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? In other words, no one can stop God from what he wants to do. So God's not outside of time here. God is inside of time doing what he wills from generation to generation, working all things according to the counsel of his will. And it says, nobody can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? 
No one can stop God, and no one can bring God into account. No one can charge God with any wrongdoing. No one can say to God, God, you're evil and wicked, and bring God into account because you have not given us this free do-as-you-will system. But you're doing as you will. See, she's actually teaching something demonic. She's the one teaching this free will philosophy that is not derivative from Scripture that denies the sovereignty of God that he does according to his will and that he predetermines things. We see King David say, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days were written in your book were ordained for me before one of them came to be. Once again, we see that God predetermines things, and he doesn't just predetermine some things, he predetermines everything, that all the days of my life, every single day, was written in your book, and it was ordained for me before one of them came to be. Now think about all the days of your life and the things that happened within that day. Think about today and everything that happened. Well, that was written in God's book, and it was ordained for you before one of those days came to be, before you had your first day, before you were even born. God wrote this day in his book, the day that you would be here watching a True Speller video, hearing about God's sovereignty. And everything that goes on and proceeds to happen the rest of this day, and the day after, and the day after, all the way to the very end, to the day that you die. That was ordained by God, and it was written in his book before one of them came to be. So we see that God is not outside of time. He's directly involved with the things that are happening, and they're happening according to the counsel of his will, something that he's predecided from the very beginning. He declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that have not been done, saying, my purposes will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So the day that you were born into this reality, it was God's plan, and he had decided how your life will go in its entirety. From the day you're born to the day you die, and he's not outside of time watching this happen, he's making it happen. See, now that I myself am he, there is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I heal, and there's no one who can deliver from my hand. So when it comes to you being born and when it comes to you dying, it is the hand of God. And there's antecedent causes by which happen in your life by which you will die. And there's antecedent causes by which you were born. God is sovereignly in control of all those things, working all things according to the counsel of his will, something he decided in his book that were written all the days of your life that were ordained for you before one of them came to be. So she has these unfounded accusations and threats in her post simply because in her human pride she thinks that she could, should be in control and that man's will should be dominant in reality and not God's. And that there's not this free will chance system going on. She doesn't like a God that's in control. She likes a God of her own idolatrous conceptualization that she demands that you bow down before too, or it would be better for you not to be born, to be cast into the midst of the ocean is what she's saying here. She doesn't like a God who's in control. She likes a God who relinquishes his control to the will of man. We can see from scripture, there's no such thing as chance. God doesn't relinquish his control to anything even the casting of the lot, something that people would look at and say, this is chance. When this happens, when I throw this lot up, when I toss this coin and flip it, whatever comes up will be a complete random act of chance. The scripture says the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. That the lot is cast into the lap. When you toss a coin and you expect something to come up, people think, well, this is chance. Whatever comes up, the Bible says it's every decision is of the Lord. And let me tell you, God is not just sitting there watching this outside of time and he says, oh, someone's tossing a coin. Uh, let, me, let me decide what this is going to be, what's going to come up. No, he decides this before the foundation of the world, not only the casting of the lot, but that the lot would even be cast. He works all things according to the counsel of his will, including the men casting lots. 
consider this verse for people who do not like that God predetermines things according to his plan. Have you not heard long ago that I ordained it, days of old that I planned it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should crush fortified cities into piles of rubble. So from the human perspective, one would say, well, it was the generals and it was the soldiers that made the plans and it was their actions that brought this about. When an army overtakes a city, but it says, have you not heard long ago that I ordained it in days of old? I planned it from the very beginning before the foundation of the world. He declares the end from the beginning. Now I have brought it to pass that you should crush fortified cities into piles of rubble. Notice how it says, now I have brought it to pass. Now this is speaking about the Lord. The Lord is predetermining something, something he has decided from long ago and ordained it in days of old. He planned it and then he brought it to pass. Now be still to know says that if you teach this kind of thing, you're teaching something demonic. If you're teaching that God predetermines and plans something and then he brings it about according to the counsel of his will. From the free will perspective, when you take God out of the picture, you would look at this event and say, well, it was generals who planned this. It was soldiers. It was the high ranking military men of that time that had planned this and that brought it to pass. But from God's perspective, have you not heard long ago that I ordained it and days of old I planned it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should crush fortified cities into piles of rubble. And this is not just one singular incident by which these things happen. The Bible teaches that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. When the trumpet blows in the city, do the people not tremble? And when a calamity happens in the city, did the Lord not bring it about? There's a cause and effect reaction in the happening in this verse that says, when the trumpet blows in the city, did the people not tremble? So there was an effect when there was a trumpet blown, it meant that the enemy was approaching and the people would start to tremble. So we see this cause and effect relationship. And then it goes on to say, and when a calamity happens in the city, did the Lord not bring it about? So when we consider the calamities that happen in cities all throughout time and all throughout the world, they're not by accident. They're not without purpose. They're not without meaning. They're not without reason. God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. The good and the bad. I create light. I create darkness. I create well-being and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So God is sovereign over reality. He's not outside of time watching things happen. He's making them happen, good and bad, calamity and well-being. I, the Lord, do all these things, not some of them, but I do all of them. I am the one who forms light and I create darkness. I create well-being and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So this modern woman who holds her free will philosophy has gotten a YouTube account. She thinks she can get on YouTube and threaten people with some of the harshest, worst accusations for teaching that God is sovereign and that he is God and that he has free will over the reality that he created. We see the scripture tell us in the time of prosperity, be happy in the time of adversity. Consider for the Lord has made one as well as the other. Now think about when adversity happens and when prosperity happens. In other words, the good times and the bad. Well, those things are not independent from antecedent causes. And what the scripture is saying is God is the ultimate origin point and the ultimate cause. As he works all things according to the counsel of his will, having purpose, having reason, having meaning. And so when prosperity happens in your life, when adversity happens, they're not independent from causal effects. God is saying that he's the ultimate causal effect for everything that happens. In other words, God is predetermining everything. The prosperity, the adversity, the antecedent causes that make those things happen. In the time of prosperity, be happy. In the time of adversity, consider. For the Lord has made one as well as the other. And we know those who are the called of God, that he's working all things together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. That God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God 
and are called according to his purposes. He's working all things, good and bad, to the end that they would be good for you, the ones that are called. And when we look at the scripture, not everybody is called. Consider your own calling brethren. Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty according to the flesh have been called. But God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the mighty. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And the debased and the despised things God has chosen. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are that no man may boast before God. So we see again, God is not outside of time watching salvation happening. He's calling people. He's choosing people. He chose them before the foundation of the world. Then he calls them at some point in their life. And then he places them in Christ Jesus. It says, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus. So it's not the free will decision of men by which they're in Christ Jesus, but by God's will. And it says that if anyone would boast, that they would boast in the Lord. And that's what we're boasting in, in the Lord, that he chose us and he called us. We see in the verse that he called some over others. He chose some over others. And this is why people are calling us demonic and saying that it would be best if we had a millstone cast around our neck and thrown in the ocean because there's something demonic is happening there's something demonic happening in the flesh of people by which when you point out that you were saved by god's grace and not by a free will decision a choice spiritual forces of wickedness do not like it when you teach sound doctrine they do not like it when you teach that God is sovereign over salvation. So they have to bring accusation. They have to threaten you with something. They have to try to do their best to make you feel that you're not of God simply for teaching that God is God and that he's in control of things. For he spoke and it came to be and he commanded it and it stood firm. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations. He thwarts the devices of the people and the counsels of his heart stand from generation to generation. So we see when it comes to the plans of the people, God frustrates the plans of the people and the plans of nations he frustrates. And the desire and the purposes of his heart stand for generation to generation. And remember, this isn't something that God is making up as he goes along. This is something that he has predetermined and predecided before Anything came to be. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that have not been done, saying my purposes will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So remember that when you're teaching the scripture, when people throw that accusation on you that you're demonic and it would be better for you to have a millstone cast around your neck. Are they providing any scriptural basis for that? Are they just operating off human emotion? See, the heart of this, and you can see it with what these people say, that God, if you're in control, especially of men's salvation, then you're wicked, you're unjust, you're unrighteous, if you don't leave it up to the will of man. If you don't relinquish your will and your decision on who comes into your heaven, and you don't give us all a collective equal offer by which we can boast in our choice before you and other people of why we're in your heaven, then you're unjust, you're unrighteous, you're wicked. And the people who teach that are wicked and unrighteous and unjust too. And it would be better for them to have a millstone cast around their neck and thrown into the deepest parts of the ocean. You can see where this free will stuff leads to. It leads to a lot of division, people boasting in their choice before God. When the Bible says, consider your own calling, that God chooses some over others that no one would boast before God because by his own doing you're in Christ Jesus. This free will stuff leads to people boasting before God, denying the scripture, twisting the scripture, and then trying to bring accusation on the children of God and on to the saints who hold to the sovereignty of God as the scripture teaches it and God's predetermination. See, when it comes down to it, there's a large aspect of God that these people do not like. In fact, they hate it. They hate God. They hate a God that chooses people. And they hate those people who say that they're chosen. Those who say that God chooses people, they hate those people too. And yet Jesus was one of those people. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So these people clearly hate a God that chooses. And they clearly hate 
those people who say that God has chosen them out of the world. And that's exactly what Jesus said. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So they hate a God who doesn't give them an opportunity to boast in choice. They hate a God that chooses people out of the world to be saved. And they hate those people who say they've been chosen. And yet that's exactly what the Bible says. Is that we've been chosen for salvation. And rather than hate God on the basis of being chosen, we should thank God for those whom he has chosen. Brothers, we're always bound to thank God for you. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. That we should thank God that you're believers. That he chose you to be believers so that you would believe in the truth. See, she hates a God that chooses people to be saved from the beginning. But Paul the Apostle says we should love and thank God who would even choose people by his grace to be saved so that they would believe in the truth. So I'm going to wrap it up here, brothers and sisters. I see I'm going on just about 30 minutes, so I hope you're having a good night and a good day. I just want to demonstrate, again, the faulty reasoning of these people that hold to free will. That there's a way that seems right to a man, but his way ends in death. There's a way that seems right to them personally, their own views, their own opinions, but they're not operating from God's mind and from his perspective, what the scripture reveals about his sovereignty. And if it's not of God, then guess where it's from? If it's not coming from God, what she's teaching, guess where it's coming from? So the very accusation that she's accused us of, the irony of it is it actually applies to her, that she's teaching demonic teachings of free will that does not have its root in God's word and in his spirit and in the apostles, the prophets. Nowhere in scripture do you find this idolatrous conception of free will that she's proposing. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Peace to you. Take care. And I hope your night or day is going good.